welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week's question is, why do bad things happen to good people? Let's listen to Pastor David's answer, especially to people who doubt. I know it doesn't feel like that outside, but summer will be winding down, and so we'll be starting something new in the middle of August. But this question today is is really a challenging one to to answer. Uh, Here's what we'll be discussing. Why do bad things happen to good people? I know you've wondered that before. And there are some examples. Cancer, school shootings. How do we explain, especially to those who doubt, an all-powerful God and the horrible things that happen to innocent people? Well, in many ways, this is the question that Christians have to answer, both for themselves, but also to those who are outside the church. I can't tell you. How many times as a pastor I've heard a variation on this question where people have just wondered, okay, how can there be a a good and faithful God on the one hand who's all-powerful and can do anything God wants, but then I see this world on the other hand, and the world is full of pain. The world is full of of suffering and, and of evil. How do we reconcile the two things? That's something that we're going to explore together Uh, really for the rest of the sermon today. Uh, Some people wonder, can't God just stop it? I mean, can't God just, if God is powerful, stop all the evil from ever occurring on this earth? And I thought about that this week, and, and I wondered, okay, well, consider this. What if God did? What if God stopped all possibility of evil in this world? Can human freedom still exist? Can God stop evil and still retain the possibility of free choice, of human freedom? There are some things that are impossible, even for God, because they are intrinsically contradictory. It's kind of like that question. Uh, Can God create a stone that's so heavy that not even God can lift it? You go, oh, That's kind of hard to answer. That's a little bit of a gotcha question, isn't it? Because any answer you give isn't going to really reflect very well on God. You could say, yes, I mean, God can do anything. So God can make a stone that's so powerful, so heavy, that God can't lift it. But then you're saying God has a limit. There's something God cannot do. And so then you think about it and go, but I don't want to say no. I don't want to say there's something God can't do. And so you're just kind of stuck. But what I would do when I would look at that question is I would say, well, the question itself is inherently contradictory. It's kind of like this. Can you create a round square? Well, you'd think, no. I mean, inherent in being square is four sides. You can't have a round square. It's a meaningless question. Which brings us back to our question today. Can God have created a world where humanity was free to act however they wanted to, but where evil choices never occurred? And I would say no, because that's a contradictory question. The freedom of choice necessarily leads to the possibility of those choices being evil. We live in a world where God chose to give us the ability to choose. And I think that's why all through Scripture, God is almost pleading with people to choose love, to choose the way of God, to choose building the kingdom of God right here on earth. It's because God realizes the very possibility of that choice being inherent in every human heart. So God chose to make this world just as it is, even with the possibility of evil. As I began to think about that, I thought, you know, the reason that that probably occurred is because choice is essential to us being human. If we did not have choice, would we really still have our humanity? Probably not, because if we were programmed to only do good, we'd be more like robots than really humans. Well, but God created us with the free ability to choose, 
And then God asks us and encourages us to choose the good and the loving thing. What we see so often in this world is people don't do that. In the 5th century, St. Augustine was wondering about this same question, which really I take some comfort in, that we're not the only Christians who wonder about questions like this. All the way back in the 5th century, people were wondering about this. And here was his answer. I really kind of liked it. He said, you know what? If we loved in the, the way that God wanted us to love, there would be no possibility of evil. And what he meant by that is he, said, he came up with this concept called ordered love. He said, if we love things in this order, then evil would not exist. He said, if we love God first, if that is the first thing, the foremost thing that we love in this world, there would be nothing else that would supersede that. We love God first, we love others second, we love ourselves third, and we love possessions fourth. He said that would be good ordered love. It's only when you start mixing up the order that evil can really seep its way into the world. So let's say that you ended up loving possessions more than you loved other people. Well, then you're going to make choices based on accumulating, on getting what you want, even if that negatively affects somebody else. Or let's say you chose to love yourself first, even above God. Well, then the choices you make in this world will be based on what's best for you and not necessarily what God is asking you to do. Ordered love. If we're able to love like this, our world would have a lot less evil. We look around at this world today, and I know that you acknowledge there's pain and there's human suffering what we must decide as Christians is how do we live in this sort of world? Well, I really think there's two possibilities to that. There's the cynical approach, and there's the faithful approach. And those are the two approaches that we're going to study today in response to living in a world with pain and suffering. Uh, let's start with the cynical approach. That comes from the person who wrote the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. You know, this person looked out at the world, and much like you, he saw everything that was wrong in the world. Uh, he saw evil, and he saw suffering. He saw pain and death, even for innocent people, and based on all that he saw, this was his conclusion. He says, I looked and saw all the evil that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And so based on what he's seeing here, he says, I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. Whew. Okay. Okay, that is one approach, isn't it? Here, the author cannot reconcile a good and loving God with the world that he sees. In this world, he sees oppressed people who are innocent, and yet there's no one interceding for them, no one bringing justice for them. He looked at this and said they don't have a comforter, and he concluded that it'd be better to not be born at all than to see all the evil that exists in the world. That's one approach that you can take. I mean, this is kind of the approach where you see something horrible happen in the world, and you just you throw up your hand and say, I don't know what to do with this. Or maybe you go run into a corner and weep because you can't comprehend the pain that you're seeing in that moment. I mean, it is really easy to feel helpless in the midst of all the pain in this world. But as Christians, we are not helpless in the face of evil or suffering. There is a way that I believe God wants us to live in the midst of what we are facing. I call this way the faithful approach. And the faithful approach comes from the book of Hebrews. Uh, the author of Hebrews is writing to first century Christians. And first century Christians were enduring quite the suffering 
quite the amount of trials and, and persecutions. This was a time when it was illegal to be a Christian, where Rome had built this Colosseum and then were dragging in Christians to be tortured and executed in the Colosseum. Uh, this was a time when Christians were torn from their homes and then brought to the public square to be publicly shamed and insulted. This was a dangerous time to be a Christian. And the question we ask is, how should these Christians live in the midst of all of this? And this author of Hebrews provides for us a roadmap. It's a roadmap that I think worked well in the first century, and I think it's a roadmap that continues to work today in the 21st century. Here's how he begins. He says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, meaning after you had become a Christian, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. So the author is speaking of this time that I referred to, of conflict, of suffering, of, of persecution. And he wants to make it clear that they who are reading this, they had to endure that firsthand. And sometimes even worse, they had to see their loved ones or friends endure it as well. And notice that part of this was this public spectacle of Christians being dragged out into that public square to be insulted. I bet those Christians at times threw up their hands and said, God, can't you do something? God, can't you intercede for me in some way? God, why are you, all-powerful, allowing this to happen? Because I bet those, those Christians in the first century wondered the same thing that our question is wondering today. The author of Hebrews doesn't give an easy answer right away. He's realistic. He continues to share their examples of suffering. Here's what he says next. He says, You suffered along with those in prison, and joyfully, oh, there's an interesting word, and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property, because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So what he's alluding to is at times, Christians in the first century were physically forced from their property. If they were not allowed to live in their dwelling anymore, what that meant is Rome would either imprison them or send them into exile. The author of Hebrews is realistic. He says, I see this all taking place. And so what encouragement could he possibly give to them? Well, how about this? The author of Hebrews says, even though your property is being taken away, one day you will receive possessions that are better, that are longer lasting. Now, he's not saying, okay, the next house you get is going to have a longer warranty. It's going to be a lot better. That's not what he's saying. The author is alluding to the eternal rewards of God that are reserved for those who choose to live this life faithfully. He is telling them to keep an eternal perspective, even in the midst of all of their suffering. I think that's our first takeaway for today. When we say, how do we apply the first century to the 21st century? This is it. We take an eternal perspective when we are in the midst of our own pain and suffering. What that means is that the suffering that you are in today, whatever that is, and however you would classify it, whatever you're going through today will not last forever. It has an end. It is temporary. But the rewards of God, the faithfulness of God for you, that is eternal. That will last forever. I think of something Paul said when he's thinking about the same concept. And he says the suffering you're in today, he calls it a momentary affliction. And what he means by that is he says it's momentary. It's not going to last forever. It's an affliction. It's not easy. You wish you didn't have it, but it has an end point. In fact, here's how he puts it. He says, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 
as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. To choose to live this life faithfully is to make the choice to look for the things that are unseen, as well as the things that are easily seen. Because when you're in suffering, what is easily seen? It's the suffering, right? When you're in pain, it's hard to see anything else besides the pain that you're in. But Paul's saying, don't just do that. Look towards what is unseen as well. The unseen reality of the presence of God that is here for you. Because when you keep that perspective in your mind, that eternal perspective, what you realize is that I'm being prepared for something greater. And whatever I'm going through right now can be a preparation process for what comes next. We can see easily our suffering. But Paul says, look to those unseen promises of God. So I think when we keep this eternal perspective, it will become much more challenging to remain cynical, wouldn't it? Because you know that even in your pain, that God is good, that God is in control of your life and in this whole world. All right, so we keep the eternal perspective. What else can we do? Well, the author says this next. He says, so do not throw away your confidence it will be richly rewarded. Yes, you keep your confidence even in your suffering. So I think the natural question is, confidence in what? If I'm sick, it's hard to maintain confidence in my body. Uh, If I'm going through something where I see something in the world that's very traumatic for me, uh, maybe it's a school shooting, it's hard to maintain my confidence in the goodness of my fellow man. But guess what? We don't have to remain confident in these things. We keep instead our confidence in God, and specifically that God is good and that God is in control, even in the face of evil and suffering. That word confidence is used later in the book of Hebrews, but translated a little bit differently. It's translated as courage. I really like that, because I think it takes courage to continue to live faithfully in this world, trusting in the goodness of God, even in the midst of all that we see. And we see a lot these days. I don't think we realize sometimes how unusual it is that we are so in tune with the suffering all around the world. I mean, you can turn on the news any day, And immediately, you know the worst things that are happening around the world. That would not even be true maybe 50 years ago, where you would know the suffering maybe in your community, but we're exposed to it now so on a so much greater scale that it can seem overwhelming. Paul says, keep confidence, not in that, not in what you see, but in the God who is in control of everything. I'm so inspired by those people who go through really hardships and challenges and who are able to still hold deeply to their faith. I'm sure you can think of examples of people like that in your life who have gone through something really hard, and yet when you talk with them, you see the goodness of God, faith in God, and was pouring out of them. What that means is that when you go through hardship, you can be that inspiration to others. When you hold on to your faith, others can look at you and say, ah, I see the goodness of God still at work in this person's life. So we have these two things. We have the eternal perspective, and we have confidence in the goodness of God. But there's one more thing that the author of Hebrews wants to end with. He says, you need to persevere. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. So people who are choosing to live in this faithful approach will choose to persevere through the challenges of life without becoming jaded or cynical. Think about that word persevere for a minute. It really means two things in this context. It means to endure and it means to overcome. 
There are some things that you just need to endure. These are things you don't really like. You wish they weren't happening, but you can't get rid of them. And so instead of saying, woe is me, or instead of just becoming cynical towards the world, you say, okay, God, I'm going to get through this. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to endure because, God, I know that you're with me. And I know that you'll strengthen me even though I'm having to go through this. And so is there something in your life right now that you have to endure? Is there something in your life right now that you have to overcome? This is what the author means by persevere. He's realistic by saying this is not an easy road that we have to walk. This life is not always the easiest life, is it? But guess what? You don't walk this road alone. I mean, for one, look around you. You've got the community of faith, and all of these people are walking this same road with you. And so you do not walk solo, but you walk with this church. And not only that, but you walk with those who have gone before you. People in the first century who are having to face the challenges of their time and their era as well, thinking through how do I live faithfully with what is in front of me. We don't do this alone. We do this, taking the next step on a long journey of faith that people have been walking for a long time. So tragedy will strike. Pain will come. These things should not surprise us. When in a world where God has given everybody the ability to choose, too many times people choose evil. Yet even in the midst of this, we journey together on this road together. When I think of, of this and, and how this applies to walking in our lives today, I, this phrase kept coming back into my mind. The phrase is, draw near and persevere. I think that's your marching orders today, is whatever you're going through, no matter how challenging or painful it is, the first thing you can do is draw near to God. It's not isolate. It's not just try to get through it on your own. It's draw near to the God who's with you, who loves you, and who will be with you every step of your journey, no matter how painful. The scriptures tell us that when you draw near to God, God draws near to you. How beautiful is that? So we draw near to God, and then we persevere. We say, I don't care how hard it gets. I don't care how winding this journey is. I'm not giving up. I'm trusting that God has a deeper plan in all of this, and I'm going to continue walking one step in front of the other. So no matter what it is that you came into church with today, whatever burden you are carrying, know that you're not alone, that Christians have been having to walk faithfully for generations, and that we continue that, and we get through this, together by drawing near and persevering. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.